I'm Mel. And I'm Tiff, and we're on Pump, the podcast that keeps you updated on all things perfusion and cardiac surgery. Today, we'll be sitting down with Nathan Minnie and Joseph Pachacala of Massachusetts General Hospital, giving you an inside look on one of the country's most sought out perfusion clinical rotation sites and competitive new graduate employers. Joe, Nate, welcome to the show. How's it going? Hey, how's it going? How are you guys doing? We're good. good. We're excited to finally get this on the books here. I guess Tiffany was saying that a little bird to- told us you guys wanted to start with two truths and a lie here. <laughs> <laughs> are, are we ready for that or do we just want to get warmed up and then ease into that <laughs> reality? I'm fine with whatever. Yeah, I'm fine with whatever as long as uh, Joe goes first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe just to start with, if you guys could share a little bit about yourselves and your background and how you ended up where you are today, that would be awesome. My name is Nathan Minnie. I'm a perfusionist at Mass General Hospital. I also sit on the ethics committee for AMSEC and the ICEBP for perfusion. I worked in the cath lab, electrophysiology lab, cardiac rehab, stress lab. So I've been working clinically for about 10 years, but I've been a perfusionist for three years. And I'm just Catch Kyla. I've been in the medical field probably for about somewhere around 15, 16 years now. First 10 years, I was an anesthesia tech at Mass General. And then in my last couple of years there, they, I went back to school, became a perfusionist. I've been a perfusionist now for almost five years. I sit with the academy on the simulation board and with AMSECT, I sit on the awards and recognition committee. I also try and volunteer like wherever I can. At Mass General, I sit on the I'm the ECMO liaison between the perfusionist and ECMO specialist, and I also am in charge of our simulation at Mass General. Also involved a little bit of clinical research. Well, thanks for coming on Pump with us tonight. We're excited to hear your insights and learn more about MGH. I first to get started. I mean, I love that you guys brought in that you were in the medical field prior to going into perfusion. Can you talk just briefly about how that helped you during perfusion school, what that shift was like going back to school, that decision process, and whether or not you had to balance personal things or things in your personal life while going back to school for people who are interested? Sure. I was at a point in my career where I'd kind of become the highest level of anesthesia tech without becoming the manager. and wanted to do more. Uh, I had a conversation with my wife and I was like, they had kind of offered me a management position. And I was like, I'm not sure if I want to do this or not. I kind of want to do something more clinical. So I'm going to start job shadowing. And I just working at Mass Channel for as long as I did and meeting as many people as I did, I just started to job shadow everybody. And the funny thing is when I was an anesthesia tech for like six months, someone's like, you should be a perfusionist. I was like, that looks so boring. <laughs> and I was like, I, I don't think I could ever do that. That was boring. <laughs> and then come back seven years later, I actually sat down with the perfusionist and watched what they did. And I was like, this is the coolest job ever. And I came home and I told my wife, I was like, I think I want to be a perfusionist. And she's like, great. Are there any schools in Massachusetts? And I was like, no, the closest one is New York or Connecticut. I was just like, I think I'm just going to apply everywhere and wherever I get in, we'll figure it out. And so I ended up getting into the school at North Shore University, Long Island, LIU Post. And so that meant, well, we were moving to New York City. I was super excited. I can't say the same for my wife. She went along with it. And we were at a point in our life where we were starting to save up for a house. We were starting to plan for a family. And there's a lot of considerations to be had as to like what this was going to look like and we just knew that if I didn't go forward and, and do something more that I'd probably regret it. And this was the time to do it. And I always tell people there's no time like the present. It doesn't matter how old you are or how much responsibility you have. Like it's only going to get worse. So just go for it. Take out loans, ask family members for money, like whatever you have to do to get it done, just go for it. I actually, so we moved to New York and then my final year in school, we actually had our first kid. So not only were we in school in a city where we didn't have any family, but we also had our first child while I was finishing up school. 
Wow, that must have been a lot, especially going through rotations at academic medical centers in New York that literally never sleep. Yeah, I had a day, the day my daughter was born, I had a day off and then I had to go back to clinicals. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Wow. What about you, Nate? Uh, yeah, if I didn't start working clinically, I definitely would have never even stumbled upon perfusion. Uh, I started working in cardiac rehab after an internship during undergrad, and I kind of heard about perfusion there. My manager at the time was great, and he was saying, hey, yeah, this is a good job, but you know, you're definitely capable of more, and this isn't shouldn't be the end of the road for you. I eventually made my way into the cath lab a couple of years later, and in the cath lab, I watched an ECMO initiation for the first time, and that's when I met a perfusionist, started talking to perfusionists. I got to shadow the perfusionist there. Shout out to Pat Trainer. He's a uh, forty going on forty years, so I think some people might have heard of him. He definitely helped me get into perfusion and was very accepting me coming by and just popping in whenever I had free time in the cath lab to watch a case. Uh, and then I ended up going to Quinnipiac for perfusion school. Moved there, which from Boston is probably about two and a half hours. So I definitely was kind of on my own out there, but. I did like kind of the smaller class, had about nine people in our perfusion class, and we were a good team. Everybody seemed to get along, so that really helped the time go by. Also, being the first COVID class, things were definitely a little bit interesting, but no, it was great. It's definitely a lot to balance, but I definitely agree with what Joe said. Going to perfusion school has been such a good investment that I've made. Yeah, you're going to have to take out student loans. Yeah, it's going to take up some time, but... You know, now that it's all said and done, looking back, I would do it over a thousand times. It's really, it's so inspiring to hear. There's so many unique stories behind perfusion and how people learn about it. And I definitely hear a lot more how much more competitive schools are to get into. I'm sure at the time y'all went, it's not that easy to get in to make those first steps in perfusion. Nate, so at Quinnipiac, you worked with a program director, Mike, what was his last name? Mike Smith. Great guy. Yes. I actually used to email back and forth with him quite a bit when I worked at Children's Hospital LA. For a while, we we're taking students from Quinnipiac University, and I remember how pleasant he was to talk to and how much of a great resource and how passionate he was about perfusion. Yeah, he's great. He's very helpful, was always there like for us to pop into his office if we had a question. And even after graduation, he stayed in touch and made sure things were going well. And he started that that program, is that correct? I believe so. Yes, I think so. And how do you guys know, Mel, how do you know Nate and Joe? You guys seem to go way back. <laughs> Yeah, so I had this really interesting opportunity to volunteer within the perfusion department at Columbia New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York. I was offered an opportunity to apply for that position the first day that I shadowed. So I kind of went in thinking I was just going to get one case and use it to help me apply. And I got to meet the director of perfusion that day. So I tried my hardest. I had my resume ready, like I emailed it to him in front of him. And a couple months into volunteering, Joe had been, he was rotating there for over a year, right? Joe, you've been there for quite a while. So I remember someone telling me early on, like when you find someone willing to teach you, latch on to them, ask them questions, try to find them during the day. And I remember since the first day that I met Joe, like he kind of took me by the anesthesia ventilator and he was asking me how much I knew about it. He started teaching me. He was so open, so welcoming, so willing to go the extra mile despite how many hours he was putting in at that rotation site. So I just tried to find him as often as I could. I kind of just kept following him around. And for some reason, he never booted me out of his room. <laughs> so that's how I met Joe. And then I met Nate through Joe at AMSECT last year, right? Last year? Yeah, I think it was last year. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Over. I, I think Nate could tell you, I love to talk. So if there's someone that's going to listen to me talk, <laughs> I'll definitely entertain them for a long time. Well, All it's, right. inter it's interesting because we don't have, I don't have memories of Joe being that nice to me when I started at my school. <laughs> <but. laughs> 
Oh no. <laughs> it's going down. Two truths and a lie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. That's awesome. I was listening to your guys' initial recording with Mel and I was just kind of like laughing and I don't know, the whole time I loved how comfortable y'all were around each other and I wish we could air some of those fun comments, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Some of them might have to go into that director's cut vault that doesn't see the light of day until way later in their career. <laughs> we can put some in the bloopers yeah. later on. Yeah. When Nate's getting the award for Perfusionist of the Year, you just yes. play one of those clips. <laughs> oh my God, no, yes. Uh... That would be perfect. We'll hijack his thank you speech. <laughs> yeah. Um, this episode has been a long time coming, so it's been a while since I've listened to it. I, but I do, there were some parts that stuck out <laughs> you sure we can't air you know, these two minutes right here well basically we wanted to get you guys on to talk a little bit about mgh it's such an interesting place to work an interesting place to rotate especially at the helm with kenny shan now who i would say could be called a bit of a progressive in perfusion he's not afraid to try new ideas He's not the kind of leader that has one foot out the door, got comfortable in his position. He definitely seems to be the kind of man that shows up 110% every single day, um, churns out new leaders, but also pushes the envelope with clinical research. So you don't get that a lot. Can you guys tell us a little bit about an overview as of MGH as an institution? Yeah, so I mean, MGH... As an institution, I mean, the main reason I decided to work there was because, long story short, they do it all. A lot of patients go there because they get turned down other places, and everybody wants to give them a chance. It's definitely tough, but it's great to be able to show up to work every day and see something different, which is what I really enjoy. We do liver transplants. We go on VV bypass for those lung transplants we actually just recently built a hybrid ECMO circuit what we'll call it for those so it's kind of our cardiopulmonary bypass circuit where we bypass the reservoir and make it like an ECMO circuit for the lung transplants and obviously we do heart transplants all the aortic work it's a great place to work same with all the MCS we do it all so as an institution it's very compelling to work at, very challenging as well, but in a good way. And I feel like on top of that, we get, we have students, so we get, we have the opportunity to teach and share some of our knowledge and kind of impact the future of perfusion. And then like you are saying, Kenny is pretty progressive where he really cuts out some time for a lot of us to do some extracurricular activity, whether it's clinical research or writing papers or developing some of our own leadership skills. He's really pushed a lot of our team to do more. And it's been great doing some of the research and getting our hands really involved. Nate and I have a couple of papers that will be coming out that that we're co-authors on in some pretty big journals like Nature and, and stuff like that. I can't wait to hear more about those and read your papers. I mean, speaking of Kenny Shan, he really is a dynamic leader. I, I've worked with him on the ICBP so how do you feel that Kenny promotes leadership and succession planning for perfusion through his work at MGH? I feel like when I think about Kenny in that I learned a, a while ago about something called like spotlight leadership, where someone really, instead of takes on everything for themselves, he tries to find skills that other people have and help to develop them. Kenny's not the type of guy that sees somebody and is like, oh, I can't work with this person, but he finds a way to work with everybody and helps to push them to be a better worker or leader or like whatever role he's trying to develop within them. He never sees a challenge and like backs away from it. He really pushes into it and takes it on. We've tried a couple of different initiatives like over last year, including like a post-operative debrief where a lot of, I think a lot of people would see it, some of the challenges that we've had so far and kind of just like back off and leave it. But he's the type of person that's, you know, this is going to be something that will be good for not only for our team and for, for the other providers, but also for the patients. And so instead of kind of cowering away when things aren't going perfectly, he kind of pushes into it and says, no, we need to see how we can make this better and how we can get people to actually buy into this. 
like Kenny, he's very thorough and very diligent. And he's also like back to what you said about leadership. Like he's also a great support system and a great mentor as well. Like he's there to go to if you have a question or if you're are like, Hey, this is something I want to get into, or this is, I have this idea. Like he's very receptive to all that stuff. And he very much appreciates and enjoys when people come to him with that stuff because he's happy to help. And he's very good at guiding you, but you still are doing it on your own enough, if that makes sense. That's awesome. I think that's so important in leadership to have someone that recognizes like a strength in you and to push you um, to be better. That's really cool that he does that in a, a current new role as a leader. So I'm learning all those things and definitely taking notes from Kenny. Yeah, he's fantastic. From my short time and getting to know him on the ICBP and at the MSEC meetings, I've always I've always been in awe at his ability to be direct and to speak his mind, but he's never come across in a way where people feel threatened. Like they generally just listen to what he's trying to get across. And he brings such like an interesting flavor to the conversation, like playing devil's advocate or bringing up a point that sometimes people feel a little bit more hesitant to bring up, but it's, it needs to be said, or it needs to be considered within a conversation. So I've always looked up to him for that capability that he's had. Yeah, for sure, Mel. There's one thing I think of the time that I've spent with Kenny so far that I can say I've hands down taken away from him is I remember one time me and him, we were having just a, a nice one-on-one -on -one conversation. We were talking about leadership skills and mentorship and stuff like that. And just like challenges and having tough conversations was the topic of our conversation. And he put it very simply, and it stuck with me ever since. He said, you, you can never go into a conversation wanting to win. Mm -hmm. And if you take that approach towards any, like any of those situations, I think you'll come across exactly the way you just said about how Kenny comes across, which is, I think, uh, very respectable. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I love that. I love that quote. I think mentality and perspective going into a conversation plays a big role in how people walk away feeling about you and about the topic and about the overall encounter. Um, you guys have talked before about how there's support from the top down. You guys are always pushing the envelope there at MGH, trying new things. And a lot of that, I think I can safely say, comes from having good communication and relationships with surgeons, anesthesiologists, periop directors, like you need those relationships in order to bring things to the table and have space to improve your center. So can you talk a little bit about that top-down support at MGH and how it might be different there than other institutions? I think it, it comes directly from like Mass General as a, an entity, but also it's a very strong culture that our surgical director, Dr. Sunt, has put forward is that everyone has a say and that people need to have the opportunity and feel like they're going to be heard when they speak up and that no one should be really a target for speaking up, even if they're wrong in what they're saying, just so that people don't become afraid to talk and then they don't talk and then it affects a patient. So he's really created this culture where people all have a voice and are able to speak up. It starts off daily. We have a huddle as a whole team. And then we also individual ORs will have a huddle again where we all are on the same page about the care plan for the patient going forward and then we can talk about the concerns that we have going forward and then at the end we have a kind of debrief it's not perfect yet but we're working on a debrief where we can then talk about like what went on during the case that we could improve upon. I think that um, Kenny has really taken this culture and, and really pushed it forward to have the perfusion team not just be just not be present, but become a resource where people see the um, knowledge that we have and really respect us as a team. And he's really pushed us that if we are perfusionists and this is our, if this is our warehouse, we have to know everything about it. And so he's really pushed us to increase our knowledge, to read papers, to um, know our protocols and go forward so that when people want to do something that might not be safe for the patient or kind of goes against what we typically do at Mass General that we speak up and say, actually, we all agreed upon these protocols and we don't do that here. And Joe, you talk a lot, uh, or you just spoke about culture. 
Can you speak to the evolution of this change from your personal or professional perspective and in the time that you've been with MGH? I mean, how do you change culture? What do you think it takes? I think first it it takes someone to be kind of a a leader that's going to lead by example. And so creating a safe space within a certain team and and having it be small and then kind of have it grow from there. So creating like a place where teammates can can have a conversation and talk to each other about maybe something that like a near miss or something that went wrong in the OR that's not punitive, but it's educational so that we can learn what went wrong, get to the root cause of the problem, and then kind of change that and then have that kind of grow from there organically. That's awesome. Yeah, I read um, a quote recently by Jason Fried. He's the CEO of Basecamp, which is a software company. And he says, and I, I just want to share this little quote here because it does kind of um, ping off of what you just said. Company culture is not written down. It's acted out. A company's culture is a 50-day moving average of how it is, not how it thinks it is, wants to be, or was supposed to be. So with that said, can you tell me a little bit more specifically what multidisciplinary involvement looks like at MGH? I know you spoke a little bit about your debrief practices, but are there any other things that you feel are important to mention? I think some of the other things that we do is with simulation and education. So our simulation isn't concentrated on just our team, but it involves our um, ECMO specialists, our cardiology fellows our cardiac surgery fellows and attendings. We're starting to do our different intensivists throughout the hospital are starting to learn some of the stuff that we do and how we can work better as a team. And so we're starting to to grow from within the OR to outside and really affecting the entire hospital. So can I ask, are perfusionists normally involved in the timeout period as well? in the beginning of a case or mostly just the debrief period? So during our huddle, like during our huddle, we have a whole section that's dedicated to us. So we go over like cannulation, we go over like cardioplegia strategies, we go over pressures, temperatures, basically everything uh, that we plan to do with the patient we go over. If we're going to circle we talk about if we're going to do any uh, cerebral perfusion or lower body perfusion. That's excellent. I wanted to also bring up how another part of multidisciplinary involvement that I think has, I didn't realize there was so much variation place to place was whether or not perfusion was invited to M&M and Grand Rounds. So can you guys talk a little bit more about how it is the experience going there? What do you think the whole team gains from it? What does the perfusionist contribute to it? And how the surgeons there will ask the perfusionist that was on the case rather than their go-to person to kind of have a discussion in front of everybody about what happened during a case? Yeah, so we have M&M every Thursday morning. Thursdays are kind of our late start day. So in the morning, we'll have our perfusion team meeting, which is just us as perfusionists going over whatever it may be within the perfusion team. And then after that, M&M starts and... It's a very vast group that attends, everybody from the ICU intensivists, nursing, obviously the attending surgeons, anesthesia, perfusion, and other and nursing as well, OR nursing. It's all held on Zoom. Everybody Zooms in. It's this massive Zoom. And we all take part in the conversation as necessary. Typically, if there is a perfusion, a direct perfusion question about the case that's going to be brought up, Kenny will send out an email to the team. These are the discussions this week. These are the patients. These are those perfusionists who did these cases. So he's kind of telling us, be prepared to have to step into the conversation. And sometimes we're not involved at all in the conversation. Sometimes we are. And it's our job to be able to say, okay, this is what we did during this case in this instance, and this is why we did it. And again, back exactly what you said to the culture thing it's not meant to be punitive it's meant to educate and to grow and do better for the next time i think we also do besides the m&m experience and grand rounds we also if there's a if there's something that happens within the or that we might have a smaller debrief on the side where perfusion and the surgeon or in anesthesia depending on who's involved will come together and have a discussion to see what what went wrong and how we can improve next time. 
And it's never, I've been in, involved in two of these and it's, it, I can say for sure, it's never been punitive. It's not really ever been who's at fault, who can we blame? It's what went wrong and how can we affect it? How can we make change so this doesn't happen again? Does your institution have a process to kind of write those incidents down or record them and kind of make them be at the forefront of a mistake that you don't want to make in the future? Or is there any kind of written portion of those debriefs? We do have for near misses and for things that go wrong, we do have a safety report that we fill out and we have a, a an entire like department that kind of reviews those and goes through them with us. Does that go into a bank of the general incident reporting system for the institution or is it cardiac specific? It's for the entire OR, I believe, is our incident reporting system. Okay. But they, I think they have them for all the different departments of the hospital. So you did mention a little bit about the clinical debrief protocol already. Is there anything else you could think of that you'd want to elaborate on or where the inspiration for that project came from and what MGH aims to achieve with it? The debrief protocol, I believe, came originated, and I could be partially wrong here, but I believe originated from quality improvement with the ICEBP with Kenny Shan, Donnie Lukoski, and Mark Martin. When I joined the ICEBP, I asked to be a part of quality improvement as well. Then that post-op debrief is also part of a residence project here as well. So we kind of saw an opportunity there to how this could be a great tool in the OR, and we're trying to expand it from there. And the resident at MGH is also involved. We think it could be great because the times that we have kind of tried to roll it out, I've been a part of, I think Joe has been as well, and at the end of the case, when the surgeon says everything, all the everything that uh, went on in the case, then we also stop and we go to each discipline and say, do you have anything to say about the case? Do you have anything remarkable or any concerns about the case or anything that we could have done better? And it's very much so, like everybody says, I know we keep saying it, but it is not meant to be punitive. It's meant to learn and grow. When we have had, there's been times where the, attending says to the fellow oh you could have done this like you could have done that or maybe do th do this next time there was you know one time i was like oh don't clamp the cardioplegia before telling me <laughs> uh, <laughs> and stuff like that so it's a good way to grow and to educate yourself to not make mistakes and, and make things go better moving forward very inspiring thank you for sharing so i was always curious if somebody listening to this podcast goes to a more progressive center and they decide that they want to join this initiative, are they still able to, or at this moment, is it a closed pilot program? I, I don't know the answer to that. That's okay. I mean, I was, they can yeah. do whatever they can do whatever yeah. they want. It was what it yeah, comes down to. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. At, at the end of the day, like you can make up your own post-operative debrief and yeah. and go for it for sure. I mean, and I know the plan. I can say with the plan with this is to expand. Just same thing with the pre-op huddle and get it out there. Yeah, ours is still in development, so it's not perfect, but I, I guarantee if there's someone out there that wanted to start something, that Kenny would share what we have so far and not make them start from scratch. All right, cool. So if somebody listening in wanted to kind of probe a little bit deeper on that, should they just email Kenny Shan? Would you guys be able to throw out like a You can email me email? Yeah. if you want. It's and mini, so N as in Nathan, M as in mini, I, N, I, E, so small, but with an E at the end. And then at uh, h.harvard.edu. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I know there's going to be someone who's curious and like willing to go to bat for this at their center and why not help them get it underway? Emails are already flowing in, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I just sent a quick one, so <laughs> this might be helpful for me uh, in Austin. Yeah, two weeks later, you see like 
<laughs> Nate's email literally like spazzing out and like no longer <laughs> takes any more in the inbox. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> You'll have to hit the do not disturb button. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm really kind of excited to move into this next set. Uh, section of questions. So beyond the clinical work, what research projects or extracurriculars are available to perfusionists at MGH? Where do we start? There's so many. There's probably not an aspect of our team that isn't kind of headed by someone other than Kenny. I think Kenny's done a really good job at, at kind of assigning people different things or Someone will go to Kenny and say they have an interest in something, and then he kind of finds a way to let them kind of delve deeper. Basically, any of our any of the things within the NST, uh, within perfusion, our uh, QCing of our different point of care testings, our MCS stuff, simulation, education, students, all those are kind of headed by someone on our team who then kind of report back to Kenny. And then some of the extracurricular stuff, there's a bunch of different clinical things that we're doing where it's both like wet lab stuff where we're actually in the lab doing stuff. So Nate and I are working on some ex vivo perfusion stuff with hearts and lungs and hopefully soon maybe incorporating a kidney into the heart circuit. We do some stuff with surgical research where different animal models are put on bypass so that the surgeons can achieve certain things. So whether or not they're doing a surgical repair or seeing how uh, different cardioplegias works and uh, stuff like that. There's also some more library-based research projects that we have, whether it's uh, going into our uh, past cases and really pulling out some of the data to, to research different things, or it's if you have a certain topic that you're interested in, you want to learn more about, or maybe write a paper about, we have a ton of resources that are at, a dispo at our disposal so that we can achieve those. I know you guys are really busy clinically, but do you guys get cut out time or clinical research time to work on these extra things or it does it, it just depends on your caseload or how does that work for you all? It's a variation of both. I usually we'll look at the schedule the following day and see what's allowed and kind of with staffing and what's going on in the OR. And of course, if there's room for, if somebody has something going on that they need to get done or some research that they're trying to do, and there's some room for them to not be assigned a case that day, then great. Of course, we'll definitely do that. And usually Kenny or our lead perfusionist, Christy Adata, will make the case assignments the night before for the following day. And same thing, too, if you have any requests or if, oh, hey, like I got this going on or I got this meeting, like maybe like you can put me on X case because it's shorter or an afternoon case because it starts at this time so I can do this. They're more than happy to help that isn't frowned upon. And then sometimes, too, we'll even get scheduled what we call in-house days which is where you can come in and you can sit in our perfusion office and get work done and you're not really expected to be in the OR. So for your perfusion office is it like a space where everyone has a desktop area can you all do you all have access to what you need for research or is that something that comes with time hospital build or I'm asking for a friend. I'm kind of, I'm kind of dodging no, around no, this question. <laughs> so we have, um, we have like two, we have two spaces. So within the OR, we have a pump room where mm -hmm. there's computers and, and stuff like that. It's all shared. That's a shared area with, between like everyone in the OR. Mm -hmm. And then we have a separate office that's out of the OR where we have three workstations and those are a shared space. And so typically we don't have three people who are in-house. So there's always a spot when you're scheduled to the in-house day or if you're free and, and you don't have something going on, there's typically an open computer that you can head down to. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Do you guys have access to the online library from home or is that something you can only access on site? We have access at home. We have a, a a host of journals that we have access to, both in-house and at home. 
That's excellent. Would you say that makes a big difference for somebody who's inclined to do research? Would that be something that would be a vital resource for them or a big hurdle if they don't have it? Yeah, I think if, I mean, if you're trying to do research and you really need to start someplace, it's the, for usually the first place is going to different journals and seeing if some, someone's done something similar or if there's some research in the same area. And so having having a multitude of journals that we have access to. And the great thing about Mass General is if we don't have a certain journal, we can just tell them that we need a journal. And if we can basically send an email as to why you need it, and they kind of make a decision whether they subscribe to the journal or just get you the issues that you need. Do you guys have laptops that you get to bring home or is this purely access through an intranet sorts? Just through the internet. I'd love to take some time and talk about your simulation lab for a little bit. I love blowing stuff up, pressurizing things, can I say? I'm like a child at heart with perfusion equipment. But I'd love to just talk, I'd love to just have you guys make the case for a simulation lab. Like if somebody works somewhere that doesn't have it, like what would be the reasons that you would put out there that are strong to fight for one? What can it do for you? How can it improve clinical practice? help you understand perfusion equipment, kind of just like, what are the multitude of uses for a sim lab that should be considered by an employer? One of our most recent projects that was kind of huge for us is we were looking at new bypass machines. And so talking to the different companies, what most people like to do is just bring a pump in and you bring it into an OR and you like try it. Uh, we don't really play that way at Mass General. So we not only did we trial it within our sim lab, but we actually trained each one of our perfusionists on the new machine prior to bringing it to the OR for trials. So everyone, we made a, a team of super users within the sim lab, and then we trained the entire team to use the different bypass machines, or actually there's only one new one in the other machine we already had. So we were training them on that new machine to see if we were going to use it or not. And the great thing was, is they could ask questions, kind of make their mistakes downstairs in the sim lab. So that when we were actually practicing on a patient, they were a little bit more at ease. They'd already seen it. it nothing was brand new to them. The other great thing is it's a great way to kind of trial protocols before putting them into play. So you can say, is this protocol going to actually work? And so we can, whether it's a protocol for like, an oxygenator change on or something like that. We can do anything downstairs where patients aren't at risk prior to bringing it to the OR. I was just going to say it's great for new hires and for students as well. And those new hires, it's not just if you're a new grad, but uh, we have a rule where no matter your experience, if you're a new hire, you're going to observe for OR cases for about a week or two. Then you're going to hop on the sim lab on the Clefio with Joe, and then you'll actually start to pump your cases. And then same thing with students who start the rotations. So you're never just kind of thrown into the mix and you're not, it's not like a sink or swim type situation. We, we know this is a stressful situation. There are lives at, at stake every single case. We want to make sure everybody's as comfortable as they can be. Yeah, we worked really hard on our protocols and they we review them yearly. And Kenny makes sure that it's not the same person every year review, reviewing the same protocol. So the team really has a say in what how we practice perfusion at Mass General. And because we've worked so hard on them, we want to make sure that anyone that gets behind a pump follows those protocols. We have there we don't let our surgeons like request certain perfusionists for anything. So they just have this expectation that whoever's behind the pump, they're going to get the same level of service, whether they're a student or someone who's been on a team for 25 years. So we work really hard to make sure people understand our protocols and know how to treat patients well. So Joe, with that said, what kind of protocols are your go-to protocols for your simulations to kind of start someone out? For the first day, uh, like first time we go into sim lab with students or new hires, it's, it's really just a straightforward case nothing goes wrong. It's just to make sure people know how we test our line, how we initiate bypass, how we maintain bypass, how that they're hit. We have checklists almost for every step of the way. So we make sure that they're hitting 
the checklist when they're supposed to, that the standards that we've set for DO2 and for pressure and flow and stuff like that are being met on bypass. And then also that communication is happening between the perfusionist and the clinical provider. Awesome. And I have to be honest, I've never used the Califia, but I will get the opportunity to at the end of this month, <laughs> just a little background. We don't have, or we're not practicing clinically yet. Our hospital officially opens in, in late February now. So this is going to be a big thing for us because um, we have brand new Essence heart lung machines and we're first install in Texas. Woohoo. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. But it's just, it's a lot for my team to take in, um, just kind of transitioning from the S5 to the Essence. So I'm looking forward to that clip, yeah, use. And if there, there are any pointers that you have, <laughs> please share. Yeah, I think the, the Califia is a great tool. The hard part about Califia is well, as a someone who's in simulation is learning how to use it well. And then taking the time to actually create the different scripts and programs for the different simulations that you're going to be doing. The last thing you want to do is like kind of go down to the sim lab and just start like clamping lines or try and like mess people up. But if you can create a, a repeatable simulation for people to go through, that's what I've found has actually worked best. And having a, a point where you go through the sim, you do a little bit of teaching and then afterwards you can have a little bit of a conversation with the person and how, like what went well and then how they could improve. That's really good, good advice. I'm going to definitely make use of that. <laughs> yeah. The Calivia is great. It's literally a blank slate when you get it. And I've talked to them. I was like, it should come with at least like 10 simulations. So someone can just like sit down and use it. So there's a little bit of a learning curve when you first get it, but it's great once you understand it. Awesome. We do have like a professional that teaches with a Califia that will be representing oh, nice. that side of it. So I am, I'm happy that she's coming, but for the future, I mean, we don't have our own Califia and it sounds like you all do, right? We do. We purchased it. We, they purchased it before I was on the team and they were able to show um, how it would improve in patient safety. Uh, it's very easy to kind of prove that. And with the stuff that we've been able to do over the last couple of years has been great. Uh, we're getting to a place now too, where we'll be able to get the surgical fellows, hopefully trained enough to sit at least for a Califia case. And then maybe even to assist with cases within the OR once going through some training with us. Awesome. It's funny. One of the, one of the stories I heard about Mass General is that when they first started using bypass machines, actually the surgical fellows would pump the cases. So in the morning, they would kind of switch off. So if you were pumping in the morning, then you would operate in the evening and, and vice versa. And it became like, I mean, being a perfusionist is a crazy job. Imagine having to then learn surgery on top of that. And so it was becoming too much. And that's how they started training people on the job to run the bypass circuit at Mass General. Wow. Awesome. Have you guys ever thought about using, I mean, I hope that you haven't had to have this experience, but should you have an adverse event occur in the operating room? Have you ever thought about setting up a simulation based mimic of it and then test the rest of the team to see how many of the other perfusionists might fall into the same pitfall or catch that before it becomes like an issue? clinically to kind of prove kind of like how Sully, when you watch the movie Sully about how he landed in the Hudson, like a lot of people didn't really believe that he had achieved a feat. They thought that he had failed and it was only after they put it through the simulation and had multiple pilots try to land the way that he did using the minimal equipment that he had available to him. Were they able to prove that what he did was heroic and not necessarily a failure, a catastrophic failure? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it's definitely useful for that. And we try to do it when, whenever we can. And even down in the OR, say we have a primed pump that we're actually not going to use or something, we'll kind of take that time to create scenarios or be like, oh, let's like, oh, we got this here. Let's do a quick oxy change out or 
oh you got air in your cone let's practice like doing that real quick and but yeah we're always trying to whenever we have the time use it wisely and educate ourselves and practice the different scenarios yeah we also have tried to replicate things if if something happened with the in the hour and we don't really understand it we've tried to then bring it back to the sim lab and see if we can replicate it to make it happen again and then understand it so we don't have it happen again that's so powerful to have those tools available for you and new perfusionists starting out so good on mgh for all yeah. those resources that you have at hand but i guess kind of to switch gears here we have the opportunity coming up to interview Doug Vincent on VentraFlow. So I'm kind of excited to ask you guys this question regarding VentraFlow. Can you both talk a bit about how the partnership with VentraFlow flourished at MGH? I actually think so. We were introduced to Doug because of the lab and the recent and the ex vivo research that Joe and I do. Through that, we have a new attending surgeon uh dr ali Ravi, he's great he's very much into transplants uh ex vivo perfusion and then our a more a much more senior attending surgeon dr d'alessandro uh, who is a mentor to dr ali Ravi, is who introduced us to doug vincent and kind of made this whole networking thing happen because of the research that we are doing he suggested we use doug's pump the venture flow and so that's how we met Doug and the, it's been great. I have nothing but positive things to say about Doug and about the pump. Doug's a true engineer at heart. If you start talking about anything to him, they're like, oh, I wonder if we could do this. Like he spends like the next week thinking about it. And then the next time we come into the lab, he's like, hey, we were talking about this and he comes in with a solution. He's a very interesting character. That, as Nate said, the other thing is, is like his pump's amazing. I, I can remember when I first got into perfusion, I was like, why isn't there anything that really acts like the heart? Like we don't have like true pulsatile flow that is affected. That's like afterload sensitive and stuff like that. And Doug actually has created something like that. The hard thing is it's hard to change the way things are. I always tell people that when they talk about like changing culture at Mass General, and you kind of ask like that. The way that it was described to me is it's, sometimes it's uh, turning a cruise ship with an oar. And <laughs> sometimes it just takes time, but it'll happen. And I, I think I'm truly believe that for, about the venture flow pump. I think we've been so used to the way things are either roller pump or centrifugal head that people are going to get used to it. And we've been able to show some of the things that people are saying is like, oh, you can't deliver pulse through an oxygenator, but we've clearly shown that within our lab where we can show a true, like a true dichrotic notch from his pump through an oxygenator that's being delivered to a heart. Yeah, we're fascinated to talk to him. I got to see it at AMSECT and I like, I started asking a whole bunch of questions like, and he went with all of it. Like he was genuinely just excited to show it. I'm like, how do you de-air it? What if air gets into it? What does it look like? How do you take it out if you have to change it out? Like I question after question, and he just kept demonstrating each component of the pump and I was really astounded. It seems like it's very well built. Yeah, I would definitely say, thinking about it from the perfusion perspective, kind of everything you just said, Mal, like how do you de-air it? Is there bubble detection stuff? I think it's great. I And even in the sense of kind of, if I had to compare like de-airing his pump to a centrifugal head, I would say that it's easier and better and safer. Uh, Doug's great. I'm excited you guys are going to talk to him. I love Doug. Just hearing that made me smile because just once, uh, just knowing Doug as a person, he, I, I kind of to build on what Joe said too. He, you know, we have our, it's at the point our research is scheduled every week where we have, you know, like hearts on, we do ex vivo hearts on Wednesdays and ex vivo lungs on Mondays, stuff like that. And it seems Every week I'm getting a new email or two about some new article about something we discussed about oxygen delivery or micro circulation, something like that. And he's just, he lives and dies by it. He lives and breathes it. He's great. I'm excited for you guys. We were just on kind of holiday break from our lab and he 
I think it was January 2nd, he kind of gave everyone the holidays. He had this email that was like 17 pages long with a bunch of papers in it and different topics that he's been waiting to send to us. And that's kind of like how he is, but he's also just like a genuinely nice person. Like even during the holidays, like he opened his house and his family to the entire lab staff. So if anyone didn't have a place to go, he was just like, hey, it's like he lit we work in Mass Massachusetts. He lives in New Hampshire, just over the border, but he's just like, it's far, but I mean, everyone's welcome. That's awesome. I've never met him, but I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. You might need like a five hour recording session for that one though. He's, <laughs> I'm he's, so ready. I love to talk. He <laughs> loves to talk. So good. That's what we like. Yeah. <laughs> People that like to talk. I love that. Uh, we kind of segued into this space, how, it's when you talk about industry presence at your institution, like a lot of people are kind of just happy to say, well, yeah, like we have reps come in sometimes we get lunch, but I feel like MGH truly embodies what it means to have industry presence. Like you guys are working with, you're working with first Doug, like you're working with the founder and the engineer of a device, like the amount of knowledge that you're going to gain from that entire process is it's unfounded. And you guys are always working with different components of industry at your institution. They're a big presence there. So what do you learn from that? Like, how does that contribute to your department? Why is that important to stress to different places? Like, why should you be chasing after industry presence? Like, why should we strengthen relationships with industry? I think we should strengthen relationships with industry because it's just another avenue of learning and bettering yourself in the care that you're going to provide. We also have monthly meetings with Impella uh, about patients and that we put on Impella 5.5 or CP combination of because we also put in the right side of Impella now too. We have kind of pretty much m m once a week once a month for impella and for transmedics because we also go on the ocs runs and we debrief on the patients that we've done these uh cases with and use these types of devices and the reps are there for those m ms as well so it's very insightful because they can give us tell us something that we don't know it's going to help us learn and then now we know it and then it's better for next time yeah, I think um, industry should be seen as a resource. It's always good to, everyone has the best product. And so you have to take everything with a grain of salt and see where it's coming from. But no one knows their product like they do. And so they can come in, teach you, guide you through, whether it's building a VAD or um, diagnosing issues with different pieces of equipment. No one can do it better than them. And so having to meet the rep, getting their contact information. So if you're ever in a situation, you know who to call and how to get in touch with people to get yourself out of a bad place and to care for people the right way. I agree. And I think that relationship with the reps and other industries helps them improve too. So feedback from perfusionists, I think that's so important so that our equipment improves over time, given our clinical feedback. Yeah, I love that you guys brought that up about debriefing with the reps too. Like that's not something you hear often. Like usually you you talk about speaking with a rep of, about their device and how it's utilized or the different settings on it, but you rarely hear people talk about going back after a case is complete and really going combing through it with them. Yeah, that's I feel like those have been some of the most educational things at Mass General is kind of doing our own M&M &M for MCS and for OCS, just so that we can see how to do things better. Hearing what, like not having to learn everything on your own, but seeing what other people have done or how they treat certain issues and then kind of taking that and using it yourself. I think one of the other things that's great is we've had a, a good amount of collaboration within our lab too. So our lab is kind of really Embody, embody that collaboration spirit where if basically anyone has a project that they could do on one of our rigs, like they do it. We have people with different types of sRNA and different types of gene editing, or there's all these different studies where we're doing metabolonics and metabolic assays on, on the tissues of the hearts and lungs and 
the lungs have been cool. Uh, I, we just did a, I think our first, and I think this week will be at our second time where we're working with a, a trauma team to work for on assailant for lungs. Like it, it's, I guess it's been a, an issue where it's hard to get air leaks uh, fixed properly. And they've come up with a uh, substance that they can put on a lung and actually seal an air leak, which has been pretty cool. Getting to see all these different types of exper experiments too and talking to people, to the people who are creating them has been really interesting as a perfusionist. Thinking career-wise, like you just know so many people in different, in different arenas that if you ever are in a position where you kind of need help and you have all this resource to draw on that you've had experience with. Have you guys had any experiences with reps where your feedback has been taken into account to make their device better or make a change with what their device can be utilized for? I feel like Spectrum does that a lot. They take a lot of feedback from their customers. I think they're a small enough company that they can kind of make a lot of changes whether it, whether or not it's like in the timeline that we want, it's not always, it's not always the fastest, but, but it's definitely, they're definitely listening to what their customers want and, and kind of making changes on their device. Kat, you mentioned Doug before, like we've had a lot of conversations with him and he's made, I think he's improved his device, even if it's just the way that he thinks it can operate after talking to a multitude of perfusionists. And different clinicians, I think he's realized that his device can do a lot more than he thought. Not to build up the competition here, but to speak for the competitor, Levanova, I, and this is not my podcast. This is your guys, you guys are on the spot. I, do, I did just want to talk about an opportunity I had with Levanova because they usually choose two clinicians a year or so, fly them to Germany or Arvada specifically for feedback, clinical feedback on their devices. And I, I did get the opportunity to go to Germany um, this past year to do that. And it was an amazing experience. So I completely advise that anyone who gets the opportunity should go and do it because it is amazing to see the new equipment, the new inventions that are on the horizon. And a lot of it I can't speak to right now because I signed a non-disclosure agreement, but... <laughs> to ask that <laughs> I I was about to I ask, like, did you have to sign like a waiver that's why you can't ask about I did. It? <laughs> yeah there's some really cool stuff <laughs> <laughs> Horizon, so watch out world <laughs> hey if you want to give my give them my name i'd love to go to germany <laughs> yeah it was, it was pretty amazing yeah i mean we basically it was kind of a blinded i was part, in part of a blinded um, procedure where they put me in a room with a bunch of engineers and I had no idea basically what they were going to do to me, but, <laughs> but <laughs> no, I basically sat me down and had me um, go through certain clinical scenarios um, that I had, that I was blinded to before going into that room. And they basically evaluate the engineers, field engineers evaluated what all of my steps or all the steps that I took to complete the task, they're basically, they think like engineers, the goal in this whole um, scenario was to see or compare how a clinician or perfusionist approaches different scenarios versus an engineer. It, it was really cool. So I'll, I'll definitely put your guys' names out there. I don't know. <laughs> I got a little bit lucky with the opportunity, but it was really awesome. I think it's, it's so important to do something like that if you get the opportunity. Yeah, I'd love to switch gears here and talk a little bit about how MGH is like a huge academic medical center. Usually those are prime targets for new grads because you do a little bit of everything. You tend to, I think, the more you get, the more you beget. So the more new hires you get, the younger the staff is, the more likely it is that you're going to pull more from that generation naturally because they see that there's a lot of people of their demographic at that place. So can you talk a little bit about MGH as an employer, how 
like what are some difficulties and what are some things that are easier to do in terms of hiring process, like types of people that you hire, some of those like typical things that all academic medical centers tend to undergo a little bit. Well, MGH is an equal opportunity employer, so I don't think there's two <laughs> types of people. Glad <laughs> 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 you said uh, that. <laughs> um, no, Spoken but, like uh, a true ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> we are very open to hiring anybody. It's, well, I mean, we definitely assess, hey, like, how do we think we'll, they'll fit in with the team? And I imagine all teams do that. But back to what we said earlier, too, as a new hire, you, do, as, and especially as a new student, we're not going to, or a new grad, sorry, we're not just going to have you in a sink or swim situation. You're going to go through the sim lab. You're going to take your time learning how to build build the pump, prime the pump before you even pump a case on a patient. And then we all, what's great too, and I think some people will take more advantage of this than others because Massachusetts is, you need your state license as well to be able to get your cases in. So before, so you need your 40 cases before the board exam. We, or should I say Kenny, allows that when you're in that kind of, even your first year, you can kind as long as you're, of course, being productive and learning and taking the opportunity, we are hourly paid. So he doesn't care how much overtime you work. So say you're just, sh- you're still in your shadowing phase, but you want to shadow this, you shadowed one case all day and then technically your shift's over, but oh, there's this circ arrest case going on in the afternoon. I want to stay and watch that so I can learn you're more than welcome to and you'll get paid overtime for it. So I think that's also kind of a nice perk for new hires, especially new grads. And then for the new grads too, we kind of set you up with a mentor. That mentor is, could be anybody on the staff. They're kind of, they in a way are your mentor. They're your go-to for any questions about how things work. What are the protocols? I need advice on this situation. When you are pumping case, when you're shadowing cases, you're mainly going to shadow them. When you're having somebody with you to pump cases, you're going to be pumping with them. Of course, as the schedule allows, sometimes it doesn't always work out. But so we kind of want to take that burden of, oh, I'm with this person today. Oh, I'm with that person tomorrow. Like in the variation of practice, we want it to be easier for you as, again, a new hire or a student, the whole onboarding process. So um, I think it's a great process. And Having been through it as a student and as a new hire, I'm very glad I did. I think one of the other nice things that we offer is we're an N plus one facility. So we always have at least one extra person. And so as a new hire, it can I think it can be really intimidating, especially that first call shift that you t- start to take and knowing that you'll never be alone and that there's always going to be someone else that's there with you is a true comfort and helps you to be a little bit more at ease when you're heading in for your first dissection at two in the morning. That led me into my next question was, do you have a staffing protocol? Do you have a written protocol for that? Or do you follow the AMSEC standards and guidelines pretty much? I'm pretty sure we adopted the AMSEC uh, guidelines, but for us, it's as long as there's a, if there's a potential for us to be on bypass or some sort of support, we have two people in-house always. I'd love to ask this question for all the new grads who may not be aware, but when you start a job and you're kind of onboarding, it could be a lot, right? Like you're getting used to personalities, you're getting used to gen- like staff, like in your department, out of your department, and then you're getting used to protocols. So there might be specifics about how you're pumping or how the pump is set up or specific considerations that you have to take with each type of case. You're taking notes on that. And then you're getting home kind of exhausted. And then you're left to either shadow more cases to onboard quicker or study. I remember how exhausted I was just working like eight hours a day when I first started. I go home and just want to sleep at three. (laughs) Is there any time that's given at work for a student, for new grads to study for their boards how is scheduling for their board's exams kind of dealt with at that institution? Not every institution is as friendly as another when it comes to that sort of thing. So how does MGH handle that? 
first we want you to get your 40 cases in to be able to sit for the boards but then pretty much once we get your 40 cases in i would say at least once kind of september hits we're just like nope study go study so we'll unless unless like you're truly needed because of the whole n plus one staffing model that we have if the schedule allows it we will give you i think like i said earlier like an in-house day or if we can't technically put you on the books for an in-house day we'll just say go find a quiet place and go study we'll handle the or we want you to pass the board what why you're here we need you to pass the board exam so we definitely make sure you have time to study i was a new grad at mgh and i was very thankful i think I finished my 40 cases. There were two other new hires with me at the same time. We both finished our 40 cases like early August. The rest of the time we were pretty much studying. And it was nice too, because with there being multiple of us, uh, they would let us go study together. So it was nice to have a study partner and bounce ideas, questions off each other, thoughts and stuff. So I think it's a great place for that. We definitely try to make it as easy as possible. Do you offer any specific study tools, practice exams, or offer any non-clinical time for students as well? For new grads, I mean, there's definitely some non-clinical time to go and say, Nate was saying, we all kind of have like resources that we kind of pass along to each other. We typically leave it to the year, the people who have passed the prior year to pass along their stuff because it's the most recent whether it's like study guides they have from school or from friends and stuff like that, they can pass them along. And do you follow any kind of specific timeline for the students in terms of cases? I know getting your first cases is very dependent on the individual, but do you have specific strategies on starting their caseload or getting them eased into certain difficult cases? So we make sure people understand our protocols We'll do a sim case together, then we'll kind of switch it up, maybe do a second one. Once once people are comfortable behind the pump and we feel that they can follow our protocols, we then start to put them in some straightforward cases, and then they kind of evolve from there. Our schedule, our like daily schedule, we have assignments every day, and it's, they're done by our lead perfusionist, Chris Theodato, and he puts a lot of time into it. I've never seen someone really take the care that he does to put people in cases. And so he'll sit there and he kind of makes sure that people have a good variety of cases under their belt and that people are kind of building off of what they've been doing. And he tries not to put people in like tavers all week long, which is great. <laughs> he likes to to make sure that you're not uh, doing the same thing every single day. Another thing too, for the new hires or new grad, and that mixes in with the whole N plus one thing. And like you said, getting into more complex cases, whenever we have a circuit arrest case, when you're about to circuit arrest or when you know circuit arrest is coming up, you're supposed to use Vocera, the little microphone that we have. It's a blessing and a curse and call the plus one person to have them come in and kind of just watch the initiation of circuit arrest. And then same when you're coming off circuit arrest and going on to full body perfusion, they're supposed to have the N plus one with you there as well. So even for those complex cases, even the seasoned perfusionists are never alone. We, we actually have someone with us every single case when we initiate and terminate bypass. So we feel like those are the most critical times on the bypass run. And so we always make sure we have two trained set of eyes in the room in every single OR. I feel like I'm kind of jumping around here, but I'd love to talk to you guys about, I know I went through this on the unauthorized recording version, (laughs) Uh, but uh, how you guys use DO2, how you've kind of taken those, that paper and taken a more progressive approach in terms of defining what adequacy of perfusion looks like on bypass. So can you talk a little bit about if you were there when they instituted that, how did that go? Yeah, I mean, we have a division meeting uh, where Kenny and the surgeons and whether or not he invites one of us to attend, if we have a certain project that we want to present on or a change in practice that we want to present on, sometimes he has one of our teammates present on it, where they go over our practice and, and what's going on for this month. And so that was one of the initiatives that were was presented within the division meeting. And as soon as it's agreed upon within that division meeting and no one puts up like a red flag as to why it shouldn't be, it's accepted. So as soon as we start doing something like that, 
it, it's basically the conversation as we talked about this in the division meeting and we're going to we're going to practice this way and it, that's part of the culture that we have where we get to talk about it we have a an open conversation about it and that's your opportunity to kind of speak out against it and then as long as it's not like causing harm like we continue with it to make sure that we get, at least give it a try and do2 has been one of those things that we presented on everyone agreed to do it and now it's really it's followed by all of our disciplines within the or so anytime we're not achieving our do2 it's a conversation that happens between the surgeon anesthesia and perfusion and we all talk about how we can have better flow to the patient whether it's are the cannulas and correctly can we do anything to optimize those can we hemoconcentrate and boost our hematocrit or do we need to actually transfuse the patient and then sometimes it's where like kind of borderline and the patient's doing well, like their lactate's not rising, they're producing urine, their blood gas looks good. So we hold off and then sometimes they're borderline or maybe just over what we think is a good value for DO2. And then we see their lactates going up, their urine now puts down and we might still choose to maybe transfuse someone even though they might not meet criteria 100% for transfusion, but the great thing is it's created a, a place where we communicate like almost daily that we're talking about our DO2. We do updates to the surgical team. So during our bypass run, it's supposed to be every 30 minutes. I haven't seen our teammates do it every 30 minutes, but we kind of just do like an update. Like, hey, our DO2 is like 285. We're flowing like a 28 index. Drainage looks good. We're making great urine. That way everyone knows things are going well. That way they're not surprised like later on, like, hey, like how'd the case go out? Well, I was I had a DO2 of like 160. We hadn't made a drop a year. And I tra- I gave five liters of fluid while we were on bypass and everyone's like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's never good to surprise them when things aren't going well. It's, yeah. It's always kind of better to take the hit early. I, I've learned at least. The initial yeah. hit hurts less than if you wait too long. Oh. Yeah. I'd love to ask too, so with the DO2, like how are you guys calculating it? I know you guys use Epic for EMR. So that input for hematocrit, is it, do you have a CDI in place where you update the hematocrit based on the CDI or is the hematocrit input for the formula off of your blood gas every 15 or 30 minutes? When we had our S5 pumps, we used the CDI to input the hematocrit. And then it would take the da- data for flow and would calculate it with an Epic. But now with our spectrum pumps, they it calculates it on there. We actually oh, have both nice. values that calculated through Epic and the measured DO2 from spectrum, which is also a calculation. Have you guys tried to use the TDR at all, like on your on the spectrum from spectrum? Or no, you're using the spectrum pump, but you don't have the quantum station. Correct. Okay. Oh, we do. Well, we do use yeah. Quantum Station. We don't use Viper. Okay. So you don't have like, the the ability to put up like the time spent under the DO2 curve? We do. We haven't really done much with that information yet, just because there's not a real way to kind of differentiate whether you're intending to be low flow, if you're down to put your cross clamp on or off, or if you're circa resting or weaning off bypass, all those would kind of increase your area under the curve that's calculated within spectrum. Like there's not a way to freeze it. Mm. So it doesn't account for those times. And we're not really sure what to do with that data. I think eventually we, the nice thing is we do capture all of our our data. We have, we do have a, a data collection system so that in the future we can go back and, and look at ourselves and see how we can improve. It's like music to my ears. If someone asked me what I want for Christmas, it'd be that. <laughs> we <laughs> we do report our results to perform, which is a registry for perfusionists where we report data too, so we can see how we're how we as a community are doing. So can you educate me a little bit? I'm pretty unfamiliar with Spectrum. So does your data go? feed from your spectrum monitor directly into epic as your emr or no there's a we there has to be a middle like a middle data collector so we use a company called i think it's neuron or or the 
the devices are called neurons. Our entire hospital has a certain data collection company that they use. And so we had to use that. And so all that data is collected in the patient's EMR. Is that what? Yeah, it's, I think it's collected within the EMR. And also, I, I think there's a certain data set that's collected within the EMR. And then there's a there's all of the data is collected within our own like database. Okay. And so do you end up with a, your own perfusion report that you include in the patient's chart? Or is it all electronic? Do you have a, a perfusion record at all? Or... We do. We have a perfusion part of Epic that we input data into. And so awesome. all the all of the medications that we give on bypass and then all of our like flows, pressures, temperatures, everything like that automatically load onto Epic. I'm awesome. so thankful. I've never had to paper chart. And if I had <laughs> ever had to defend myself with my own handwriting, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, we're we're in a huge transition for TCH. In Houston, they only paper chart. So in Austin, we're building out our whole electronic uh, medical record for perfusion. So that's been quite a project. And I'm doing that with Levanova Essence Patient Monitor. And not to create more competition here, but (laughs) we did. So the Essence uh, Patient Monitor does let you freeze or, or basically correlate certain events during your case to recording DO2. So you do get to isolate certain low flow events from your DO2 captures. Yeah, I'm just kind of interesting to keep in mind that technology keeps improving everywhere. And I'm sure with Spectrum, there's a lot of brilliant minds behind all the next new advancements in technology. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I wish there was more competition within our space. If there was more pump companies, I think we'd have better technology. It's great that Levanova put forward a new pump because I think it is going to push Spectrum to do even more with their pump. And I think that it's the same that like having Spectrum in the in in our area is also pushing Levanova to do more with theirs. And so it's competition is always good as long as it's pushing things forward. Yeah, definitely. I am, I do feel a little left out, never have worked with a spectrum. I think it is a really awesome machine. It does look really futuristic um, (laughs) and very minimized and Levanova that the essence is definitely more of a miniature version of the S5. So it doesn't look like they took as many risks as spectrum did, but I, I think it's all pretty amazing to learn about. So I appreciate talking to people like you who work with a different system. So I'm still learning every day <laughs> and I haven't even used it yet. So that's <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be fun. I'm still training myself. Gonna say, yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, having new stuff to play with is always a lot of fun to learn and get used to. Yeah. Pressure's on. <laughs> is no, your I'm team really... a younger team? Yeah, I do have a pretty young team. So, I mean, I have 12 years of experience I still feel like a newbie every day, still learning new things. And I have another perfusionist with 10 years of experience and experience in pediatrics. And I do have one new grad. So I'm really valuing all of your input on how you train new grads and you're at MGH. And then I have another individual who uh, worked at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She has amazing experience there and has a lot of great input on what they do and how much they minimize their circuits for pediatrics. I do feel like I have a young team, but it's a very strong team and I learn a lot from them and just hearing about Kenny Shan and how he delegates responsibilities on people and makes people feel valued. I definitely kind of want to take that into my own practice with the perfusionists that I have and make sure that I utilize them for their strengths and all that. I think one of the other things he focuses on too, is like, we're professionals, like being a perfusionist isn't just a job, it's your career. And so you have to start to see yourself as a professional and that kind of will help solve a lot of the little like petty issues that pop up on a team. Like as soon as they pop up, you just say, like, is this like what professionals would do? And typically people are like, no, and, and then they can correct themselves and, and having a healthy team where they can communicate and try and solve some of those smaller issues on their own is a way to empower your team to to work more cohesively and then 
the other nice thing is with that is like to be on, like you have to be constantly educating yourself and be reading papers and learning so that you're always able to provide the best care for your patients. If you think about the surgeons and the doctors that we work with, like they're constantly reading papers, constantly seeing what the next technique is to do within the OR and, and we as perfusionists need to be doing the same thing. Yeah, that's incredible advice, Joe. And I think this podcast definitely makes sure, keeps me on my feet (laughs) and makes sure that I'm sharp. (laughs) And on top of learning new things from other professionals in our field. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I mean, we're running a true startup. I mean, we're associated with a very successful hospital in Houston, Texas Children's, but it feels we're kind of our own entity and we're doing a lot of new things. So the worst of us has come out and <laughs> we make sure that we talk as a team and we're open and communicative and yeah, that's awesome advice. And I'm going to keep that in mind as I go forward. <laughs> I think we've uh, pretty much come down to the wire here with uh, interrogating you guys on MGH, but I'd love to ask one last question before we go. If you could give a student or new grad one piece of advice, what would it be? For me, I would say the biggest piece of advice for a new grad, and I'm thinking back to my experiences, you're not expected to know it all. So don't be afraid to make a mistake. You're going to make a mistake. You're going to continue to make mistakes. Even at 15, 20 years of experience, you're still going to make mistakes and you're not going to know it all. Don't think you have to get it all right the first time. I know you want to come out as a new grad looking really confident and impressing. You want to look good for your teammates and impress everybody. At least I did. And you're going to make mistakes. Don't be too confident. Don't be afraid to ask questions. The students who I like to work with or new grads that I like to work with the most are the ones who ask me questions and who don't assume that they know it all or that they're doing the right thing. So that would be my piece of advice. Yeah, I I agree with that point is definitely ask questions, learn as much as you can. One of my favorite questions as a student to ask is if I saw a perfusionist that did something that was like particular, oh, they always put their syringe here. Oh, why do you do that? And there's always a story like, oh, back five years ago, I forgot to do X, Y, and Z. And so now I always put my syringe here and it kind of is a way to kind of learn from their past mistakes so that you can then have a practice that hopefully you won't make the same mistakes that people have made in the past. When I first got accepted to school, I started asking the perfusionist at Mass General, what's the difference between a good student and a great student? And they all said, we can teach you perfusion. It doesn't take, it doesn't like almost anyone can learn what we do. The difference between a good student and a great student is a hard worker. It's like, I can teach you perfusion, but I can't teach you how to be a hard worker. And so I just tell people like, as I tell a lot of students like, or people who want to be students, the hardest you will ever work in your life is as a student. So never complain. Oh, I worked 16 hours yesterday. And like, just expect that you might have to work 16 hours again today. And it's not to burn yourself out, but no, like, this is your time to take it all in ask questions like Nate was saying, make mistakes, be present, see as much experience as much as you can. And so if you really want to learn what we do and and really become an expert, like you have to put the time in. And so you have to expect to work a little bit hard in the beginning. So with, with that said, a little birdie told me that I could hire you two as consultants. Is that always on the table? <laughs> yep. Yep. That works Austin for me. City Limits, Music Festival, Formula One. <laughs> anyone <laughs> I, I would love to come and visit anytime yeah that'd be great you guys Texas are welcome. Is on my list of states to come I'll, it's I'll huge so I'm not sure if I would are you what city are you located in Austin Texas oh that's where I want to go so perfect <laughs> it's really the best city in Texas so you can't beat it <laughs> well I think that wraps everything up for this episode your source for all things perfusion thank you for tuning in and taking the time to learn with us don't forget to comment subscribe and rate the podcast on your favorite platform engage with us look out for our q a feature now available under each episode description specifically on spotify